Oh, hello, everyone. I would like to say good morning, good afternoon, and good night. We have participants of all time zones in this Google Hangout. Welcome. This is the first Google Hangout of the MOOC, Turn Down the Heat. Why a four degree warmer world must be avoided. My name is Pablo Benitez, and I am one of your MOOC facilitators. I hope you're having a great learning experience. I believe yes, because of the discussions and twists we have seen. I hope that you continue with this enthusiasm over the next few weeks. I enjoy reading the different discussions. They talk about climate science, climate policy, and more important, climate solutions. For example, this morning I read a good conversation under the title, Can We Really Turn Down the Heat? Thanks to Mr. Aknola Babatunde, for, sharing, for starting this discussion. Thanks to all that submitted questions this week for this Google Hangout. A team of experts will be responding to some of your questions. Let me introduce them to you. Here we have Eric Fernandez, his advisor on agriculture and rural development with the World Bank. Here we have Tandy Matambo, she's World Bank consultant on climate change adaptation. And over here in the middle, we have Alan Miller, he's an expert on climate finance and policy. He's the former lead climate change specialist at the International Finance Corporation, IFC. With these introductions, I would like to move right away into the questions we have received in the MOOC site uh, this week. After these questions, we are going to answer some of the questions that we are receiving online uh, through tweet. So are we ready for the questions? Yes. Ready to go. OK. Well, the first question comes to us from Sarva, or thanks to Sarva. And the question says, well, it is common to see in the literature the terms climate change and climate variability. The question is, what are the differences between climate change and variability? Who, who feels like answering this? Harry, did you do that? Yeah. Thank you. No, this is a very interesting question, Saren. Um, I think, as you rightly point out, you often see the two interchangeably used in the literature. And, uh, and uh, many, many people have asked, so what is the difference and, and, uh, and why the different terms? I think you know, uh, the, the, the short answer is, is climate change refers to changes over 30, 40 year periods. So you're, to you're, you're talking long term. Uh, climate variability is usually short to medium term. And uh, that's often referred to as weather. And you know, you, you see this is what you experience on a week to week, uh, month to month basis. Whereas changes that are reported and are measured, uh, as we have done in the in the move in the turn down the heat report, excuse me, uh, refer to long longer term changes over the last hundred years in thirty to forty year blo blocks of time, so that you get reasonable averages. So hopefully that answers your, your question. And th thank you, Eric. Well, let's go now to the second question. This comes from Alexandros. We have learned that flora both trees and seaweed, absorb CO2 and help regulate things. Is there another way to make use of CO2 at all, at least in theory? And connected to that question, how many trees will we need to plant to make a significant impact on CO2 levels? Who would like to answer this question? Thanks, Pablo. I'll take an initial stab at it, and then my colleagues may have some uh, additional information to add. So as um, Alexandros recognized what we call the carbon cycle is the natural absorption and emission of carbon dioxide and we can actually measure that on a global scale as carbon dioxide in the air goes up and down in the northern and southern hemispheres with the uh, dropping of trees and of leaves in the fall and the growth of trees in the spring. So we know just from that very gross example that trees are a very important part of the carbon cycle. Although I should note, significantly less overall than the ocean. So the oceans, it's uh, estimated, take up about half of the carbon dioxide we emit, although that itself is a number which is changing. And the uh, global forests, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, about 20%. Um, there are a lot of different ways of using carbon dioxide, and in fact, it's a commercially used chemical. We mine it from natural carbon dioxide sources. We drink it in uh, drinks like 
Perrier. Um, and it's a naturally occurring substance. One of the largest commercial uses, particularly in the United States, is for enhanced oil and gas recovery. We have, in fact, large pipelines to transport carbon dioxide, and it's used by oil and gas companies pumped down in the ground and uh, increases the production of oil and gas. So the short answer is yes, but that those uses are relatively small compared with the amount that we emit. And consequently, a lot of research and investigation is being done precisely on the question Alexandros asked, which is, can we find ways to remove carbon dioxide and make uh, either productive use of it or simply pump it down in the ground or at the bottom of the oceans so that it no longer contributes to global warming and climate change? There are a lot of issues with that, and we may go into that further over the uh, later modules in the course, Pablo. But perhaps uh, the issue of the role of forests, I think, is a very good one to touch on, uh, as Alexandro suggested. Um, as I said, it, it's estimated that forests in aggregate are about um, a fifth of the current fossil fuel uh, emissions. And in theory, as the question asked, it would be possible to absorb, to reduce, for example, US emissions by about 7% by, it would require on the order of um, the size of Texas. So to just give some rough order of magnitude. That's the broad theory. There are a lot of issues, however, with that because, of course, the situation today is there's a net decline in forest cover on the Earth. And so the first issue is just can we stop that net decline, which is contributing to global warming. And that's something I think we'll also go into in further uh, modules. But I, I know that Eric is quite an expert on some of the practical challenges of uh, forestry projects, and maybe Eric would want to add a little bit. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alan. That's, that's a very nice answer. Uh, in terms of, uh, of the tree planting, I think there's uh, two or three important lessons and messages to take note of. Uh, as Alan has pointed out, the, the terrestrial part, the land part of carbon sequestration, uh, is, is smaller than what the ocean does. But on land, there's an interesting statistics. And although most of us tend to be focused on, on forests and trees, the bulk of that land carbon is actually in the top two meters of soil. Um, so this linkage between trees and soil, forests and soil, is, is really an important one to think about and remember. And as deforestation proceeds, you lose the carbon that was stored in trees. And about 50% of tree biomass, tree weight, is about carbon. So that's an important relation. Um, and uh, you don't lose all of it at one time. It may decay over several years, depending on the, on the quality of the wood. Some are hardwoods, some are softwoods. Softwoods decay faster. Hardwoods decay slower. If you make it into a nice table, that might stay longer. So there are ways to sequester carbon from the tree. Um, when you deforest, however, the soil becomes exposed to the sun. It warms up. The soil organic matter starts to decompose more quickly, and so you can get losses from the soil. So tree planting uh, also potentially reverses that. So you recover or uh, rehabilitate the vegetative cover, and you start to accumulate biomass in the trees, in the wood, in the leaves, uh, and you start the trees start to pump back some of that carbon via roots into the soil. So there's one important uh, final message is that Trees also take up quite a bit of water. And uh, so when you're doing large scale tree planting, somebody has to do uh, the, the calculations on whether that might impact downstream uh, water flows. Because if there are farmers depending on that water downstream and you're reforesting the highlands, then you could end up with some problems. But that's avoidable because we have the science now to be able to sort of do the simulations and modeling to avoid uh, over overusing water. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alan and Eric. Uh, this is a very comprehensive uh, uh, answer. So now we're talking about the action. And we have here a question from, from Heidi. So what she says is, do you think that mitigation and adaptation complement each other? Who is willing to answer this question? I can take that question, Pablo. Sure, sure okay. you, please. All right. That's a good question, Heidi. And, um, I think, yes, in many instances, mitigation and adaptation are complementary. 
um, some mitigation strategies can help you in your adaptation efforts as well as vice versa. For example, talking about trees and forestry again, um, if you promote healthy forests, you increase carbon sequestration and that can, for example, reduce vulnerability to flooding by promoting functional watersheds. You can also reduce emissions by reducing, in the water sector for instance, by reducing um, water use and then that in turn um, could conserve more water so it's, there's more water available during you know, times of stress um, including frequent and severe droughts. But then also sometimes you know you can some adaptations even though they are complementary there are some instances where you know this could work against you for example um, some adaptation efforts can um, contradict some mitigation efforts for example or make them more costly in the long run. Um, one example that I can think of is you know when cities low-lying cities or cities where which are built on the coastline and they know, they plan that they know they have to deal with um, rising sea levels and to prevent floods, they build these concrete structures. That's a good adaptation measure, but then also at the same time, you have to think about how your, you know, the production of those concrete and steel um, structures that you're going to build, and in some instances, these also will actually increase your emissions. And so here you have adaptation and mitigation actually contradicting each other. But I think um, it also it takes it will take a lot of planning and there's ways that you can actually make them more complementary by um, this is where research and development uh, come in. Um, you can you know start developing uh, materials that actually do not emit so much emissions and um, yeah. No, no, this, so this is very unless uh, somebody else also has Eric, something yeah. to. No, no, it was a nice answer. I mean, I think uh, the, you know just to link up to the previous question on, on the trees and soils um, in, in there is this what is often referred to as the win-win uh, especially in the agriculture sector and, and climate smart agriculture you'll hear that term a lot and see that term a lot in the literature uh, tries to sort of harness the synergies between mitigation whereby you preserve the carbon in the soil as much as you can uh, with the conservation agriculture no-till agriculture it's often referred to uh, and, and that helps with moisture retention, it helps with nutrient retention in the soils. Uh, so you keep the carbon and you get better productivity, the win-win. Uh, and so this is a nice example where, you know, they complement each other if, if done correctly. No, th thanks very much, Tambia and Eric. Uh, so, so it's clear, I mean, there are several actions that you have the synergies, but there are some that there may be some trade-offs, so you need to be a little bit careful how to do it. And as Tambia mentioned, strategic planning is essential. Well, let's go to the next question, and this is from Mayan. And this is linked to the typhoon Haiyan that hit the Philippines in the last year. So the question is, what is typhoon Haiyan linked? No, why, why is the typhoon Haiyan linked to global warming, and what's the physical science behind it? I am, I am interested to know how can changes in our climate system due to global warming will cause such extreme, like a super typhoon. Who would like to start with this question? I can, I can try. Try. Yeah. No, that's exactly. a very good question, uh, Mayan. I think uh, you know the. Uh, it's really worth highlighting that Mayan was was really the strongest storm ever measured. I think it was 310 kilometers per hour the wind speed. Uh, the previous record was Hurricane Camille, uh, which hit the uh, Mississippi in '69. That was about 300 kilometers per second. Uh, the the uh, the. Uh, so 300 kilometers, you know, the, the speed uh, per hour, not per second. Um, important to note that the government of the Philippines uh, launched early warning systems and that really saved a lot of lives. That's really another important lesson there, how the Philippines handled that. The similar situation recently in India where early warning systems really had a big impact. So that's important how you process this data. Uh, you can see things from satellites. You can move that data out. Now, in terms of, of uh, global warming, um, the, 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 really we have a problem because we don't have enough, uh, the climate models that are used to project what changes are coming uh, in 100 years or so to, to the end of the century are too uh, coarse a resolution to be able to give us enough projection capability of, of uh, how this climate change and warming 
may be impacting tropical storms. Uh, there is some in the, uh, empirical evidence that suggests that as the planet warms, as the ocean warms, there's enough energy in the ocean and uh, that might fuel uh, stronger storms. However, when, uh, that, uh, when that happens, you also have what, what is referred to as shear winds. These are winds that blow in different directions and sort of tend to dissipate the storms. So the consensus is out. We don't have enough data to reliably say to link uh, climate change and warming uh, to increase storm intensity, even though there seems to be a trend. Professor Kerry Emanuel at MIT uh, just recently published a paper where uh, the data suggests that uh, you're going to ha we're going to see increased frequency and intensity of storms. Uh, we will wait and see as more data accumulates. And uh, for us at the moment, the data in the North Atlantic is more robust because it's, we've had more observations. In other oceans, we don't have that data. That's why we have this question still over the, over the linkage. Well, th thank you very much, Eric. Uh, and I want to continue a little bit the conversation. Uh, perhaps Alan can, can, can chip in. But I want to ask, put here the question from Perfecto, which is very much linked to this one. So do, do the lessons of the typhoon become a new benchmark for preparing uh, for preparedness in the communities? And up to what extent can the impact of such events can be mitigated? Well, the challenge, as Eric just said, is we have to make decisions even as the science is continuing to evolve. And while recognizing that it's still very difficult to predict some of the consequences of climate change, we do know that with so much more energy in the system, in the oceans and in the atmosphere, that uh, the potential for a lot of very significant events is definitely very real. And at the same time, we are learning a lot about how to prepare better for natural disasters. Uh, within the World Bank, we have an entity, the Global Facility for Disaster uh, Recovery and Relief, which is attempting to compile a lot of these lessons, and we'll be talking about those a little more. The, one of the key points that we know is it's vastly better to prevent and to invest in making systems more resilient than to simply focus on disaster relief. Uh, currently, it's estimated that only a few percent of all the money spent on natural disaster goes into prevention. So as Eric said, early warning systems can be an essential uh, government function in, in saving lives and in making it possible, even if people don't avoid most of the damage, they uh, uh, at least will not suffer the number of deaths and, and uh, mortalities. Um, we've seen a huge amount of progress in uh, coastal areas in South Asia in particular, in India and Bangladesh. Uh, so even in areas uh, that are relatively poor, um, Small investments in uh, creating shelters, in creating um, alarm systems, which communities and people know and respond to, can be uh, enormously effective. Um, much, much more uh, can be done in that respect. And uh, that, I think, is uh, one of the ways in which international institutions and national governments and relief agencies are starting to work together much more. Oh, thank you very much, Alan. So now that we're talking about the impacts, we have another question. This is from you, Tay Tu. And he's asking, or she's asking, uh, what can be the impacts of climate change under a two degrees Celsius target? Can some of you? Uh... I'll take it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's a good question. And as you, if you, I hope that you'll continue with us <laughs> over the next few weeks in this module because a lot of these questions will be answered and our, some of our experts who are sitting here will <laughs> shed more light on this than I should be able, than I can do in, in, in one minute. So um, we're already, one thing to emphasize is that we're already feeling the impacts of climate change right now. And according to scientists, we're already, we're at 0 0.8 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, warming, that's, that's warming. And what I need to emphasize is that many of the impacts that we're already seeing, we talked about cyclones and heat extremes, these, these are likely to intensify. 
you saw earlier, if, if you um, participated in week one, um, Dr. Carl's video actually shed some light on how the physical Earth systems will respond to increased warming. And he said droughts will become more intense during the summer, sea level will continue to rise, more rain falling in heavier precipitation events, and a general continued increase in the decrease of sea ice and glaciers as you know, temperatures um, increase. So the impacts, um, most of the impacts will be regional, and there will be different impacts in different regions of the world. But in general, you know, we will see widespread food shortages, particularly in Africa, because this will affect um, agricultural systems and uh, livestock productivity. Um, in, um, in Southeast Asia, rural livelihoods will be faced with mounting pressures as sea level rises. Tropical cyclones will increase in intensity and marine ecosystem services will be lost as we get into warmer temperatures. Um, in terms of biodiversity, for instance, um, one of our, our, our scientists are expecting that 20, 20 to 30 percent of species on the planet are at risk of um, extinction. So these are some of the things that may happen, but you know, stay with us and you will learn more. And um, you know, I'm talking more about the uh, areas of concern here, and um, there is some, you know, we have to talk a little bit about some of the positives, and I think the positives will also depend on region, and um, maybe Eric can shed some light on agriculture, for instance. Yeah, no, thank you, Tammy. I think it's a very nice question, actually, and a tough one, um, and it's, it's, I think it's important, as was highlighted, that there will be some uh, severe impacts, but there, there are opportunities. Wherever we see these challenges, uh, we as human beings have often responded to challenges uh, sort of opportunities and in, in agriculture there's a tremendous effort going on across the world now national agricultural research agencies universities the consultative group of international agricultural centers the CGIAR as it's called uh, looking at new crop varieties that are more resistant to drought more resistant to higher temperatures um, to these sh rapid shifts in, 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 in water availability so that the roots are being uh, crops are being developed with deeper root systems fabulous kind of uh, research going on uh, to sort of uh, come up, you know, to try and match these uh, these challenges and sort of uh, build build up avenues for opportunity. Brazil uh, leads in this in, in many ways. It's considered to be uh, the global granary that will feed the world in the future and it's very aware of, 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 of sort of keeping at the edge at the frontier of productivity uh, and so there's a huge effort going on there with national scientists, international community to sort of keep uh, soybean, maize, uh, beef productivity, other productivity without impacting the rainforests. Uh, and, and, and recently, as we've seen, Brazil has done a marvelous job of sort of reducing deforestation there. There's been a slight uptick because of various factors. You can't just rely on, on a few uh, impacts. But, you know, in general, you see a very positive effort to meet the challenges uh, projected from, from climate change. If I could just very briefly add to that, Pablo, I think it's a very um, interesting topic and difficult to condense into a short answer, but perhaps it's worth just noting that a good example of a benefit and a cost at the same time is the opening of Antarctica. So as the melting occurs and warming is going to be greater at higher latitudes, it's disproportionately concentrated there will be opportunities for lower cost shipping and alternatives that are shorter than going through the Panama Canal to connect Europe and Asia. That in some respects is a benefit. It will uh, speed shipping, reduce costs, etc. At the same time, as Tumby noted, there are a lot of uh, ecological effects that will be irreversible that may, for example, include the extinction of polar bears simply because there will no longer be the ice which is a critical part of their habitat. Um, so yeah, no, 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 it's very important to think about the Arctic. Uh, in, in this, in this the Arctic. I, said, I think <laughs> I said the Antarctic. I think there's actually a new book that's come out explaining all this. Yes. I, I need to figure out. We can come back to that. This is good for us too. Yes. Least, uh, <laughs> and I might also just one other quick comment which is since I'm a policy person to some extent. Um, two degrees is not um, a precise scientific number. Two degrees was a consensus reached through 
scientific input, but ultimately it was a political process. And there were many countries arguing for a lower number. So particularly the small island states who are most threatened by climate change argued very uh, vigorously for 1.5 degrees. So that politically was very contentious because it would have meant the need to reduce carbon dioxide to a much, much greater extent, in fact, below the level that we already are today. Oh, th thank you very much for the free panel. It is very, very interesting uh, set of answers. So somebody mentioned Antarctica. Uh, so <laughs> let, let's, let's go to this uh, now more into detail. So this is the question from, from Cherry. So the question is, is it possible that all the ice in the Antarctica will melt? How fast? How much ice do we have? Is it possible to prevent it? Who would like to take this question? Yeah, I, I can try, uh, Cherry. I think it's, it's, a, it's a very provocative question, a very important one, as, as Alan and, and Pablo were sort of highlighting, because the poles uh, really do hold a lot of the ice. Antarctica is, is a champion. It holds, you know, it's, it's about 7,000 feet thick, the ice in Antarctica. So it's difficult to imagine that it will all melt. Um, and it's unlikely that, you know, we would get to that level. Uh, that said, there is some melting going on, uh, and it's the, the rate of melting is increasing. Uh, it, it's interesting to sort of think, I mean, so if, if 7,000 feet of ice, just the thickness of ice on Antarctica were to melt, that would push uh, sea levels higher by about 200 feet. So that's a lot of water in there. It contains about 70% uh, of the world's fresh water in the Antarctic ice, uh, the, you know, there's two sheets, east and west. Uh, and the, there, is, um, there is some, um, uh, what, what you often find, there's some controversy because uh, people say, well, on the one hand, pe people talk about uh, Antarctic ice melting, uh, but uh, when you look at images, you actually see the ice, uh, the uh, Antarctic expanding. And it's important to distinguish between land ice and sea ice. Um, in the Arctic, most of the ice is sea ice. So as Alan was highlighting, if that melts, it opens up new shipping channels. Uh, and we heard recently in the news how some shipping, uh, some ships got stuck in ice. Um, and so, you know, that makes a, a difference. If the ice melts, then ships can find new routes. And it's much cheaper than the Suez Canal, going through the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal, which is a policy importance to those two countries because they get a lot of revenue from those countries, so uh, from the canals. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on that, but there is an important point that in, in the Arctic, when the sea ice melts, this more, most, most of the ice in the Arctic floating on the ocean, you get a darker colored ocean relative to the white ice, so more energy is absorbed, and you get a further warming. Uh, in the Antarctic, that's different because this, the, the sea ice is the ice that forms every winter, uh, and largely that melts in the summer. So depending on when you look at the Antarctic, you can see that shrinkage and, and, and expansion taking place. It's the loss of land ice that generally all the measurements, and there are uncertainties in the measurements, so one can never be 100% sure, that we are losing about uh, 70 gigatons, that's about a billion tons, you know, and that's a lot of ice uh, over, uh, over a certain time, time frame, whether it's a, a decade or so, I think we have to check into that. But people are measuring that and, and sort of getting a better idea on what the rate of loss is uh, on Antarctic. But I, I, I don't think you'll see a complete melt of 7,000 feet of ice anytime soon. Well, th thank you very much, Eric. Um, we have about five more minutes, to, so we may take one or more questions. I think that people start tweeting, and if that's the case, it would be good if we find a way to perhaps uh, project in that screen. I guess my tech people are, are, are helping us with that. Um, so the next question is, well, the, the, the participant that put, put this question is anonymous. I think it's a very good question. It was not me who put the question, they're anonymous. <laughs> yeah. But it, I like the question, so, so I'm going to read it to you. So both increased precipitation and crop drought are giving us consequences of climate change. These effects seem to be contradictory. So what's the explanation? Who would like to take this one? <laughs> Another tough question, but a, a very relevant one. Um, I think I think what we are seeing is that you know you, you can get increased precipitation, and we are seeing this in very intense uh, rainfall events. So often now we're beginning to hear uh, six months of rainfall came in in two days. 
uh, and there's no way for that increased precipitation to be held on the land in any meaningful way. I mean, you can ac accumulate some of that precipitation rainfall or in dams and reservoirs, but so you can have extreme events on the one, one hand, and crop cycles, remember, can be two months, three months. If you have a tree crop, it may be a year or so, but largely most of our food crops are, are annual crops. They grow over two months to four month crop cycles, uh, and depending when that rain comes, you could have a crop drought. So even if you had a very intense rainstorm, maybe a month or a few weeks before the crop was planted, you know, a month into the crop season, you may not have any rain and you could have a crop drought. So you're looking at different uh, spatial phenomena, you're looking at different time for, uh, phenomena, and in many of the adaptation, how farmers are beginning to respond to some of the changes or the challenges from climate change and climate variability in the short term, are beginning to adjust the cropping cycle so that they can better uh, fit the crops within the changing cropping. So delaying planting by a few weeks can make a big difference. Uh, planting crops that have deeper roots can make a big difference. Spacing the crops a bit differently can make a difference. Intercropping, instead of having just one crop, you have two or three crops relay cropped, can give you a bit of risk uh, uh, mitigation. So though that's how it's, it's happening, it is possible to have extreme precipitation and crop drought, uh, and there are ways to deal with it uh, in, in, in some cases. Oh, well, thank you very much, Eric. This is very interesting. So, um, well, now we start, we're starting to get so, some questions on Twitter, uh, and uh, I would like to invite you. There's a screen in the, in the back. I don't think the participants will see those, but we're getting online the, the Twitter questions. And I think that one of the Twitter questions is very much related with one of the questions that we have in the in, in the panel in, in the we get in the web. So perhaps I would like to combine. So, so, so the question that we get from from Karen uh, in, in the web, this says, how to pursue a real energy price for fossil energy, considering externalities. So that's the question that we got on the web. However, on Twitter, we start to see something even more uh, interesting. Well. What is that stops our leaders from introducing a carbon tariff? And what are the pros and cons of such re regulation? So, so let's try them in, uh, to, to perhaps some of you can, can pick up uh, uh, these ones. I, I, I don't know, Danby, Alan, uh, Eric. Let, let me uh, try to answer briefly so we can perhaps answer a couple of these questions, mm -hmm. which are very rich and, and uh, challenging. The reality today as uh, our sister institution, the International Monetary Fund, has analyzed, is that there are very significant fossil fuel subsidies. And in fact, as a starting point, if we were to simply eliminate fossil fuel subsidies, it's estimated we would reduce global carbon emissions by 7 to 10 percent. So as an initial issue, um, we are in the bank advocating as uh, much as possible to, to try to do that. It's good economic policy, it's good fiscal policy, and good climate policy. The challenge is that often those subsidies are viewed as uh, particularly important for the poor, and they often go disproportionately for kerosene for rural areas. However, we also know that most of the ultimate benefit rarely if ever reaches poor people. It typically uh, ends up by various routes in, in fact, going to higher income Group. So um, the international community is very much on board with attempting to do that. Um, ideally, one would go beyond simply reducing fossil fuel subsidies and, as the question suggests, tax or price carbon because economic signals more than any other single measure, economists agree, would be of the greatest value in encouraging efforts to remove, capture, and reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and frankly, there is a very simple overriding challenge in doing that, which is that raising prices of things tends to be unpopular. And we've seen that in countries at all income levels in all parts of the world, that um, governments can fall when they too rapidly or aggressively raise gasoline prices or electricity prices. So uh, that's um, a simple answer, but it's uh, most of what um, is relevant. Yeah, and, and let me just add something. Uh, regarding the, the carbon taxation, of course, there, there are some very interesting experiences to learn. I mean, as you know, 
the province of British Columbia already established a carbon tax probably four or five years ago. Uh, and, uh, and other jurisdictions are also exploring. I read in the news Mexico is think about the, the carbon tax. So I think it's worthwhile. Perhaps we could uh, have a more extensive uh, discussion during during the during the MOOC discussion forum. But at least uh, there are things that are already ongoing, and then we have good lessons learned from those. Um, Pablo, I would love to come back to that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very rich subject. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, there's another question here, which uh, happens to be very much related to what Alan mentioned before. Um, okay, so what it says is. What is the future role of carbon capture and storage and enhanced oil recovery? Is enhanced oil recovery really a good solution? Is really a good bridge to advance carbon sequestration? You know, I, I, had, I, I used to live in Canada in the past before moving to here. And of course, there was a lot of action. You know, Saskatchewan has, has the thing. And uh, I think it's, I personally, I find a lot of interest in the technology. I know, Alan, you have been looking at this into more detail. Any additional thoughts to clarify this question? Well, um, two comments. Um, the reality in the world, most energy analysts think, is the world will continue to use coal. It is such a large source of energy, and it is so prevalent in key developing countries, particularly China and India and South Africa, that it's very difficult to imagine that we can, in, in any short period of time, largely replace it. So consequently, developing technologies in the form of carbon capture will be extremely important if we're going to uh, be able to avoid uh, very rapid global warming and continue using coal. There is only, so far in the world, one fully commercial uh, coal gasification, carbon sequestration power plant uh, close to fully commercial and fully operational. It happens to be in Mississippi in the United States. And that plant has incurred billions of dollars in costs to get to this initial stage. Now, we hope it will be much less expensive in the future as that technology is commercialized. But part of the way of offsetting that cost is by using the carbon dioxide that's removed and selling it for enhanced oil recovery. At the same time, there are very critical questions about being sure that the carbon dioxide pumped underground stays underground. Because if it, does, if it simply leaks, then there's no real benefit yeah. being achieved. So there are, there are technology questions, economic questions, and geologic questions, all of which are tied up in that yeah. question. Yeah, no, th thanks very much. This is really interesting. Uh, and again, maybe we could post this uh, another blog or, or discussion in the future because I also like to, to give my comments. This is very good. Uh, I was reading a, a those uh, uh, questions over there, in the, uh, and I think this is very much related. Uh, well, this one of Monica, and I was actually helping my son to do an assignment on, th on this matter. Uh, I don't know if I got it right, but maybe I like the panel is here. So, so CO2 emissions are, are very important. We know that. But what about methane emissions? What will happen if Greenland ice melts and methane store is set out? And not only Greenland, but also think about the northern Canada. We're getting loose of the permafrost. Methane comes up. Is that feasible? Is that going to happen? And Alaska and Siberia. <laughs> and Alaska. Yes. Any, any, any thoughts about this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I know a little bit about it, so I'd, I can give some comments. It's, it's not my area of expertise, but it, it is clearly methane is a more potent uh, greenhouse gas in terms of global warming potential relative to, to carbon dioxide, so people are particularly concerned about it. Um, methane coming from, uh, as uh, Alan and, the, and, and, Mo and Monica points out, um, it exists in frozen soils in, in, in areas that are currently covered by ice, so as the world warms or as climate changes, there is a possibility that these could uh, be released from these frozen deposits. And that is happening, is being measured, I think, in yeah, many yeah. places, right? Yeah, and I have read a couple of papers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause these papers in the forum so then we could go more deep in the discussion on the numbers. That's right. I mean, there's, there's an interesting point, though, that, that meth another source of methane is uh, ruminant livestock. So cattle are a big, big source of methane. In Latin America and Caribbean, almost almost 60% or more of, of our emissions in Latin America and Caribbean is the region where I work, come from enteric fermentation, ruminant livestock. 
and there's a lot of research going on now. A, because uh, there's a question I see there on sustainability. Can we eat less meat uh, in, in our diets? Yeah. Can we eat better quality meat? Can the meat produced uh, uh, be done so in, in, with less methane emissions? So a lot of scientists are working on these uh, very difficult questions, and we're making some progress. Uh, we'll, we'll see where we go. We are aware of that, and, and there are efforts in agriculture anyway to, to significantly reduce that methane footprint because of its uh, importance to climate change. Uh, there's also a huge effort right now. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's the you know effort to reduce um, or to regulate short-lived climate pollutants. So that's something that I think um, our participants could also look into, and we can post some information about that too on the blogs. Excellent. Well, thank, thanks very much, uh, Eric and Tammy, for this one. Well, I start to get some signals of, of the technical team. It seems that uh, this conversation is starting to get to an end, and uh, it's really unfortunate. But we're going to be online. Think about us. Uh, we're going to be, uh, be answering the questions online. I mean, uh, there's a lot of material here, so we're really excited about this. Um, something very important. Please note that there's going to be a second Google Hangout on February 14th. Don't forget to post your questions in advance. Send us your tweets. We may have some of the colleagues here. But we may bring another colleagues uh, to answer your questions. So, so, so keep that in mind. I would like to stress very special thanks to those participants and those experts in the panel. I would also like to thank many, many thanks to those that are now at night and they, they are connected. I think in some places it's, it's more than 10 p.m. Uh, this is terrific. If you were able to make it, it's good. I really like this. We appreciate very much your dedication. I hope to see you continue to be there in the online discussions. I will be there and also the rest of the facilitators. Um, please keep the enthusiasm and continue sharing your ideas and the rest. Enjoy this mock experience. And very important, you need to help us to turn down the heat. Well, many thanks. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.